Judah. He rules, he reigns. Come on, let's give him praise and give him glory for who he is. Come on, hey! You're the Lion of Judah. You are my Lord and King. You're the Lion for another Sunday morning, a Sunday day that he's blessed us to come together on this occasion. Oh, praise God. I thank God for another week that he's allowed us to 
be yet in the land of the living. And we come today to glorify God through the word of God. We're just so glad that you're here and with us. May the Lord bless you real good. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and for your mercy and for your grace and for how you just blessed us and brought us together once again. We ask you, Lord, to just bless the word of God as it go forth and that you would give us ears to hear and a heart to receive your word that we can put it into action. God, we pray that you'd help us to relay the message today that we have, oh God, that you've given us to share with the people that will be watching and listening to this word today. And we know that you will allow us to be lifted up in your name and we we'll glorify you for it in Jesus' name. Thank God. Amen. And amen. There's so many things that are happening and have been going on this past week until I tell you the Lord has just been good all the time. We always say the Lord is good all the time. And listen, we're not going to prolong and do a lot of the talking, but we're going to go into the Word today. I'm telling you, we're going to come from the book of Acts today. And our main thought is going to come from the 11th chapter of Acts. And we're going to probably start reading somewhere around the 23rd through 26th verse. And then we're going to just kind of uh, give you a background reading on what we're going to be talking about in this lesson today. And I hope if you can get your Bibles even today on this big, wonderful Sunday, you know that we're just about getting ready to most people to go back into the church buildings. We don't know within the next month or so, every, everybody will be going back and having a good time. But we don't trust God and put Him first. All right, let's go to the book of Acts. And I'm going to go to the... 11th chapter, and I'm going to start reading somewhere around the, well, let me see. I'll tell you, I want to read from the 23rd, but I'm going to bag up and talk about the church that's in Antioch of Syria. Now, that's not the subject. I'll give you my subject when I finish reading. Go with me to the 19th verse. We talked about how that church is going to be starting in Antioch. Now, it says this. Uh, the believers who had been Scattered during the persecution after Stephen's death, they traveled as far as Venetia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and Syria. They preached the word of God, but only to the Jews. I want you to pay attention to what they're saying here. However, some of the believers who went to Antioch from Cyprus and Cyrene began preaching to the Gentiles about the Lord Jesus. The power of the Lord was with them, and a large number of these Gentiles believed and turned to the Lord. And when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Barnabas has, was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and strong in faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went on to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, teaching large crowds of people. And watch this. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. First called Christians. So I'm going to take my thought from that verse that it's talking about here. It says, what does it mean to be a Christian? I want to ask you a question. What does it mean to be a Christian? Now, we've read some of this, and you want to know why we read it and what the background do with Saul of Tarsus, you know, and why he was, where he was at, and Barnabas had to go look for him and this sort of thing. I'll give you a little history on that. The Apostle Paul, of course, at this time, he now had received the power of God through the baptism of the Holy Spirit on Damascus Road. And we know that he was going down to Damascus to bring back the saints and persecute them. But on his way down, the Lord turned him around, gave him a new spirit. And while he was there, the Lord filled him with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And of course, he was there with the disciples, some of them, and began to get taught from some things. And he was there for a while with them. And but some of the Jews, they did not like what he had done because they seemed that they felt he had betrayed them because he was going to get those people, but now he's a part of them. So they really was after him. And so what happened here is that Saul had been sent to his home in Tarsus for protection 
after the conversion had caused an uproar among the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem. That's what happened. Now, let's go back over to the book over in the ninth chapter. I'm going to say uh, 26 verse, just to read to you. It says, when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, keep in mind now, he's been sent back to Jerusalem for protection because people was after him to kill him because of he had, uh, you know, gone from Judaism now to Christianity. Now, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. That's since he was converted to Christianity. Now keep in mind, Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking Jews, but they tried to murder him. And when the believers heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarshish, his hometown. So that's where we are. We're talking about why he was down in, in Tarshish because the saints, the, 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 the apostles had sent him down there for his, his protection. Now, it says, let us know here what was going on. I want you to be uh, with me. And so what happened? Paul, he stayed there for several years before Barnabas brought him to help the church at Antioch, all right? Now, this particular young church at Antioch, it was a curious, I call it a curious mixture. My God of Jews, those who spoke Greek, you know, or Aramaic, and Gentiles. Now, it is significant that this is the first place where believers were called Christians, or you might say Christ ones, <laughs> because all they had in common was Christ. They didn't have race in common. They didn't have culture in common, nor did they even have language in common. So it let us know here that Christ is love. It crosses all boundaries and unites all people. That's what the word of God will let you know that who Jesus is. And so the title that we've used today, what does it mean? To be a Christian. Now, this title that I've come up with is this. The title Christian, to me, it seemed to be a fallen term. You know, it had, it had been cheapened, I think, by a common usage. And it is now sort of expression that covers a multitude of religious ideas, error, as well as truth, paganism, as well as the revelation of God's divine truth. Now, this particular term, Christian, has been stretched to the extent that covers rationalism, modernism, on the one hand, and a fraud to what I call a fraudy sentimentalism on the other. Now, the term Christian is used to describe that which is coldly ritualistic and also that which is nothing more than heated emotionalism. I hope you're keeping up with me now. Now, I just wonder, is it possible that Christianity is failing to make a distinctive impact due to our failure to understand what it means to be a Christian? Everybody you talk to now, they say, I'm a Christian, I'm a, I'm a believer, and this sort of thing. But some of them, you know, they, they, they apply the term Christian to all who have high moral standards and believe the existence of God. In other words, they believe the existence of God. But let me tell you something. Do you not know the devils and the demons? They believe too, but they did not change their way. They were still demons and they were, had demonic things that they did. So they believing doesn't make you a Christian. There are others who would claim, uh, you know, this title simply because they are members of a church. Let me tell you something. Just because you get up, walk down the aisle, down to the front, shake hand with the preacher, and give him a promise you're going to do well and this sort of thing, that does not make you a Christian. Just because you sit in the pew, that don't make you a Christian. You can sing in the choir, but that doesn't make you a Christian. You can give out to the poor and do all kinds of things, but that does not make you a Christian. I want you to understand that. 
there are still others who claim the privilege of wearing, my God, this title because they have had a conversion experience. Well, ideally, they have a right to do so. However, the great test comes in what others think of our witness. In other words, when they see our lives, are they able to call us Christian? Do they see evidence of the presence of Christ in our lives? If so, only then should we apply or claim this title for ourselves. We don't want to be caught up in the saying, well, a friend of mine used to say, what you do speak so loud, I can't hear what you say. Your action sometime, I'm wondering, do that action you produce, produce the fact that you are a Christian? The disciples, they were first filled and called Christians at Antioch. And this was probably a term of derision because they were followers of the crucified Galilean, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And evidently, they thought and they talked and acted in a manner that reminded their contemporaries of Christ. Now, I wonder this. What would your neighbors, you that are watching me, you that are listening to me, what would your neighbors say about you? Is it possible for them to see features and, act and characteristics in your life that resemble Jesus Christ? I'm just wondering. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know what? Once an uh, Indian official in India, he said this to some Christian leaders. He said this, if Christians... I want you to hear this. Now, this was an Indian official talking to some Christian leaders. And he said, if Christians would act like Jesus Christ, he says, India would be at his feet. I thought that was really something for him to say. If the Christians would act like Jesus Christ, then he said, you know, I tell you, he said, Indians would be at his feet. In other words, they'd be falling at the feet of Jesus if they would act like Jesus. But for whatever reason, they were not acting like Jesus act. And so I tell you that it is time for us to cease being satisfied with a low level of Christian living. What I mean by that is that we must demonstrate that genuine Christianity is something more than cushion pews. It's more than enjoyable music. It's more than a comforting sermon on Sunday. And it's more than business as usual during the week. And since this pandemic, there has to be a change in our everyday lives. Number one, I want to tell you is this. To be a Christian, one must be saved. I want you to understand it is impossible for one to be a Christian who does not have a personal redemptive, hallelujah, relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus said over in John 3, 7, he said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You see, an individual must repent, change his mind about the nature of God. He must change the nature of sin. He must change about himself. He must change about others and change his or her behavior. That's what repentance is. It's a complete turnaround and you change your behavior. You don't just say, I'm sorry, and keep on doing the same thing you were doing. You're just talking air and you're not meaning anything that you're expressing to people. So it wants you to know that you must be one that changed your behavior. You see, inseparable from genuine repentance Sincere faith must be placed in Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life. As a man responds to the gospel with repentance and faith, you see, the Spirit of God brings about the miracle of the new birth within the soul. The believer becomes a child of God according to Galatians 3 and 26. He becomes different. He becomes a newborn. He becomes a new person. Now I want you to understand over in the book of 2 Corinthians 5, 17, he lets us know he is now a new creature because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. He is a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things, not some things, 
but all things uh, become new. I have a new way of thinking. I have a new way of acting. I have a new policy in all things that I do. So if any man, any woman, any boy, any girl, hallelujah, be in Christ, he is a new creature. Hallelujah. All things are passed away. Behold, all new have become new. You see, the new birth alone does not produce Christ-likeness. It makes possible a growth and development into Christ-likeness. It is impossible for one to be genuinely Christian who has not first had an experience of commitment and conversion. Hallelujah. Second thing is this. To be a genuinely Christian, one must be surrendered. Jesus himself, the man that we call the Son of God and who is God himself, he was surrendered completely to the will of God. Jesus said unto them, according to the scriptures, John 3, 4, 34, I believe it is, he says to them, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. His surrender, it led to Gethsemane and Calvary. Don't you understand that? He declared while he was there, he says, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. But I heard him say, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Hallelujah. How many of us can say that? Even when the Paul, the apostle, said to the Roman church, you know, that we ought to sacrifice ourselves unto the Lord. My God Almighty, Jesus spoke to the Galilean fishermen and said to them when he approached them, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they straightway left their nets and followed him. And as they forsook their nets, they began the journey that would lead them to the place where others would be able to bestow upon them the title of Christian. In order to be considered Christian, the convert of the one that come to Christ, he must be identified even with Christ through baptism. This is a visible symbol of an institutional relationship to Christ in which the individual accepts the demands and discipline, hallelujah, of his lordship. In order to be genuinely Christian, the convert must be surely sincere, my God committed to the task of living the teachings of Jesus Christ. There will be a deep concern about keeping God's holy law. You want to do everything that you can to please God and to keep his law, hallelujah, in your heart that you'll not forsake him in any way. You see, the Sermon on the Mount will be something more than just a beautiful passage of Scripture. It will mean something to you. When you hear him say, blessed are the poor in spirit, and blessed are the meek, hallelujah, and blessed are those that are hungry and thirst after righteousness, you'll take it to heart when he says all of those things on the mountaintop, because now you have accepted Jesus Christ in your heart, and you have repented and become one with the Lord. And so commitment to the will of God, oh hallelujah, will express itself. Hallelujah. Do you hear what I say? I say to commit the will of God, it will express itself. Where are we going to do it at? In the home? Oh yes. It will express itself in the home. Not only that, but it will express itself throughout the community and with the business and every other area of life. Why is that? Because the commitment to the will of God is that you have taken on the form of Christianity that is in Christ himself. Third thing I want to tell you is this. To be genuinely Christian, the convert must, I think, be serving. He must be a servant that's willing to give of himself. No wonder Paul said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
And then he said, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's will is perfect. It is the perfection that we are striving for. We haven't got to perfection yet, but we are striving every day to get there. One day it will all become perfected in our lives. But oh, until that time, we must keep looking and searching for the Lord Jesus Christ and keep holding on to him. Jesus said this. He said, My father worketh hitherto, and I work over in John 5, 17. Then he says here in John 9 and 4, he says, after he had been praying and been preaching and teaching and healing, hallelujah, and putting his hands on folk and they were being delivered, then he says this. He says, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no man can work. In other words, what he was doing is saying that while we are alive and while we have breath in our lungs and while we're able to speak and while we're able to do the will of God, we need to do it while there's life in our bodies. Because once we have died and have gone away from this world, we can't do anything else. My God, that's why Jesus said, I'm going to do all I can while I can. I'm going to work the works of him that sent me while it is day. Because after a while night's coming, and we can't work no more. My God. One some scripture somewhere around Acts 10 and 38, it was described that he was described as one who went about doing good. That's what Jesus did. Everything he did, he went about doing good. You see, there are many, I'm going to say this, there are many inactive church members, but an inactive Christian is a contradiction of terms for when we cease to serve, we cease to be truly Christian. I hope you understood that. You see, the genuine Christian, he deliberately gives himself to the task of doing good and does so with humility. He does it with gratitude and he does it without display. He's not trying to perform just to be seen or to be heard. But he's doing it because of the humility he's expanded to others. He's doing it because of the gratification that he's expressing. He's doing it because it's all without display. And as we have therefore opportunity, the Bible says over in Galatians 6 and 19, he said, let us do unto all men, especially unto those who are of the household of faith. We got to do good. Oh, hallelujah. How many of you want to do good for the Lord and treat the Lord according to the way we're supposed to do it? Hallelujah. Oh, I hope and pray that you're all Christians today. You want to be a Christian, you need to hold on to God. You need to be like Jesus. He's our example that we follow. He's not one that's just there to be a scene uh, be heard, but he's there to deliver us from our sins, and he has done just that. We are, we are Christians. Everybody want to be a Christian. Everybody say, I'm a believer. But I want you to know the genuine Christian, as I say, he will deliberately give himself to the task of doing good. He doesn't do evil for evil, but he does good in the place of evil. He does good when people don't want to hear him. He's telling the truth when once he used to lie. He no longer steals. He never does anything according that's not according to God's will. And I want you to understand that we are on the Lord's side because he's able to give you strength when you're weak. He's able, hallelujah, to hold your hand when you're lonely. I don't know which way to turn. But keep on looking to the Lord and all things will work out for your good. Oh my God, I want you to understand here in my conclusion here today that I'll tell you, it is impossible. I want you to hear me good. It is impossible for the convert to be fully surrendered and graciously serving without the leadership and the assistance of the Holy Spirit of God. You see, a part of the wonder and the miracle of the new birth is the coming of the Holy Spirit to dwell within the heart of the believer. 
the Holy Spirit dwells in the heart to produce the fruit of a Christ-like spirit and a Christ-like life. An old spiritual strong, it expresses the sincere desire of every believer. We used to say, Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. How many of you ever sang that song? Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. All you have to do is have a desire. That's what I call a definition of a Christian. You see, a definition of a Christian, I think, is that a Christian is born of God. Not only that, but a Christian is engrafted into Christ and an inhabitation of the Holy Spirit. His nature is renewed. His mind is illuminated. His spirit is changed. He's not what he was, uh, for grace has made a difference in his life. Uh, he's not what he desires to be, for grace uh, is not yet perfected. He's not what he shall be, for grace shall be consummated in glory. The knowledge of Christ is his treasure. The mind of Christ is his evidence. The love of Christ is his song. Conformity to Christ, his life. To be with Christ, his preeminent desire. I want you to know that the Christian, by faith he rests in Christ. The Christian receives and receives Christ. The Christian looks to Christ. He hears Christ's words. He treaded in Christ's steps and seeketh Christ's appropriation. He speaks the language of the Savior's kingdom. He reverences the Savior's statutes of law. He obeys the ordinances. The Christian wears the custom, consummated costume and lives to his glory. The life of Christ within him is the principle of his being. And because Christ ever lives, he shall live also hallelujah the christian uh, he lives in jesus and jesus lives in him you see christ lives and speaks and acts in him you want to to know glory to god he is christ's representative on earth i wonder how will do you to be a representative of the lord jesus christ not only that but the christian he hearkens or he listens, or he adheres, or he pays attention to Christ's teachings. He rests on Christ's sacrifice. He avails himself of Christ's meditation, and he cheerfully obeys Christ's royal laws. He inquires, what would Christ have me to do now? He wants to know what Christ had me to do, what Christ would have me to enjoy. Oh, hallelujah. Why? Because he's a Christian, and he's following after the wheels of the Lord. So you see, to know Christ is Christianity intellectually. To obey Christ is Christianity practical. To enjoy Christ, hallelujah, is Christianity perfected. As bread is to hunger, as water is to the thirsty, as the rock is to the sure to dream, as Christ is to the Christian. I want you to know the Christian is in the world, but not of it. The Christian is among the world, but yet he separated from it. He's passing through this world without attachment to the world. The world is not our home. Our citizenship is in heaven and the Christian is the impress of Christ, the reflection of the Father and the temple of the Holy Ghost. I wonder how many of you today are filled with the precious Holy Ghost and fire. If you are, you know what I'm talking about today. The Lord is on the side of the righteous and he knows them that are his. Christians, I want you to know, a Christian changes his behavior once he comes into the realm of Jesus, once he comes into the realm of the Spirit of God, once he comes into the realm of the Holy Spirit, you don't act like you used to do, you don't lie, you don't steal, you don't chase, you don't do those things that you used to do, you are now a humble soul that's humble before the Lord, and you'll do what the Lord wants you to do, you're obedient to the Word of God, hallelujah, my God, I'm getting too happy here.
But I want you to understand the Lord knows you. He knows them that are His. Oh, I want you to understand that to be a real Christian, you're not a phony. To be a real Christian, you are uh, exact in everything and people know who you are and you what you say you are. My God, I want you to know that there are so many claiming to be a Christian, but I want you to understand if you're not following Christ, you're not a real Christian. If you're not doing the things of Christ, you're not a real Christian. You're just a talker. You're just a believer in the things that you want to be, but not of God. Oh, my God, aren't you satisfied with Jesus? I don't know about you, but I'm satisfied with the Lord. All he does for us, his goodness and his mercy, his grace, his love, his compassion, all of these things to be like Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, because you are following Jesus. Hallelujah. I heard the Apostle Paul say, follow me as I follow Christ. Why is that? Because I want to be like Jesus. We used to sing that song, Lord, I want to be more like Jesus. Don't you want to be more like him? I want to be like him. I don't want people to say, look at that fella. He claimed to be a Christian. But as I said before, what he does speaks so loud, we can't hear what he say. Don't be one of those. Be one of those that people will look at you and say, I want to be like him. I want to be like her because she's exemplifying the ways of Christ. He's exemplifying the ways of Christianity as to what it should be. It's not just because you're sitting on that pew. Hallelujah, I told you. Just because a person sits in the church on a pew doesn't make him saved. Sing a song till hair raised on his head doesn't make him saved. I want to know that the Lord is on the side of the righteous and he knows them that are his. Keep in mind that we belong to the Lord. If you have genuinely accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior, you are satisfied to know that you're on his side and he's on your side. Hallelujah. I wish the folk could just give the Lord a hand. Praise hallelujah out of the glorified hallelujah. Thank him for his goodness and for his mercy and for this day. May God bless you. May he keep his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Those of you that have not even accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it's always a time now to receive him. Oh, hallelujah. I don't have to even tell you the words to tell you. You know what you've been doing. You need to repent. Tell God how sorry you are for the things that you've done. Tell him how you're not going to do those things anymore. Tell him how you invite him into his heart because he's standing at the door of your heart knocking and saying, if you open your heart and let me in, I'll come in and sup with you and you can sup with me. And this is the day the Lord can raise you up from that old dead sinful life that you're living. Change your way of thinking. Change your way of doing. Change your way of talking and thinking. Because now you're on the side of the Lord because you've accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for this day, your goodness, your mercy and grace, for how you've given us strength. We thank you, Lord, in this hour where men and women are not trying to get to you. But, oh, we look to you, God, because we know that all power is in your hand. There's nothing we can do without you. And for that reason, we ask you to remember those that are sick, those, oh, God, that are struggling, those, oh, God, that have even lost loved ones. We're continually praying for those. There are those that have called today in Texas and said their loved ones are sick. Some of them have got the virus just recently, and some have had other ailments that they have gotten a hold of and we ask you to bless and save and heal them in Jesus name and we glorify you God for all things touch every family oh God let your love continue to abide hallelujah help us to exemplify what Christian is all about help us to reflect your your reflection and we will know that all things work together for the good to them that love you who are called according to your purpose in Jesus name we pray thank God amen Hallelujah. Lord bless you real good. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this whole moment. Never I'm sorry.
Blood. 